We're in the book of uh, Zephaniah, very short book. But then most of the uh, books of the Minor Prophets are short. We gave a little uh, political background uh, last Wednesday night. And it appears that uh, Zephaniah was somehow related to uh, jo uh, Josiah. It doesn't, doesn't mean that he was in the direct line of, uh, of the uh, throne. Obviously, he wasn't. But somehow, he may have been a distant cousin or something. But if, somehow or another, he was uh, related to the uh, king. But Josiah, of course, was a uh, one, well, really the last good king of Judah before he was carried off into captivity. Now, Josiah had instituted a very extensive reforms in the uh, nation of Judah. And apparently the uh, kings and, and the nation had forgotten all about what was required of them under the law of Moses about most anything, worship and what have you. And during these uh, reforms that he instituted, there was discovered the, uh, the law of Moses, the, uh, what we'd call the Old Testament, the law of Moses, though. <clears throat> And it was brought to Josiah, and he read it. And he certainly caused him to tremble. And he, the things that it was required for them to do, they haven't done in a long time, but he implemented those changes, and they started doing it again. Of course, it didn't last, you know. It didn't outlive him. But Zephaniah does not mention those reforms at all. So it's a... Apparently, he didn't place much faith in those reforms, or he had the long view of a prophet, and he knew that destruction was going to come upon Judah, that you know they would return to their idolatrous ways, and they would eventually be destroyed. So it begins in uh, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 2, and, and, and notice that, there's a series of I wills. <clears throat> I will utterly consume all things from the face of the land. And this gives an idea of the destruction that's going to come, says the Lord. So that it's coming from him. He's the I and the will. Verse 3, I will consume man and beast. Well, we know that the destruction that was visited upon Judah, and, and of course, when these things happen, when there is a military conquest, as it was uh, of Jerusalem, not only do humans suffer, but the beasts suffer also. It continues in verse 3, I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks, and stumbling blocks are the, the idols. And the stumbling blocks along with uh, the wicked. Now, this is not to say that all life is going to be destroyed. All the fish are going to be destroyed. All the birds are going to be destroyed everywhere. That's not what it's saying. But it said the uh, destruction that's going to be visited upon Judah is going to be all encompassing in a lot of the uh, non human life will suffer also and continuing on in verse 3 he said I will cut off man from the face of the land that doesn't mean every man is going to be destroyed but it's going to be a very extensive destruction verse 4 I will stretch out my hand against Judah anytime the Lord stretches out his hand need Need to watch out. I'll stretch out my hand against Judah, 
and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priest. And uh, if you have King James or ASV, it's probably going to say Camarim, Chimarin, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but that is just one of the uh, gods or the lords of Baalism. And when it talks about priests, and the New King James says idolatrous priest uh, with a pagan priest. Well, it can mean pagan priest, but it uh, probably means priests that have given themselves over to idolatrous worship, just like the, uh, the former. Those that were assigned to, to uh, minister to the temple, but they had given themselves over to uh, idolatry. Now, interesting thing, just to, just on the side, uh, when it's a call, talks about priest, you know what the Hebrew word for priest is? Kohen. Kohen. <laughs> That's where the word comes from, Kohen. Just inside, you know. You'd be the first one on your block to know that. <laughs> In verse 5, those who worship the host of heaven on the uh, housetop, now they were, uh, Jews were warned not to worship. And that's the stars and, and what have you, moon stars and so on and so forth. They were warned uh, in Deuteronomy not to worship those things. Those things were intended to serve man, not for man to, to uh, praise or to, to worship. And it, I, I was talking about there's a series of I wills and there's a series of those, three, th three of those, those who worship the host of heaven on the house top, they were forbidden, forbidden to do that. So those who engaged in that were engaged in idolatry. Those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord. And they were swearing earth hosts by the Lord when they had no authority to do so. But all but who also swear by uh, Milcom and you have King James and may say Malcolm and uh, another another word for it is Molech. So it's a uh, one of the lords of Balaam, one of the Baals. So these people, they were swearing oaths to God, but they were also swearing by Milcom at the same time. Well, you can't have divided loyalties. It's just not going to work. In verse uh, 6, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him, just like the idols that they were worship, that they worship. They thought of the Lord exactly the same way that the Lord could not do anything. They knew that they really knew the idols couldn't do anything, but they uh, worshiped it anyway. But they treated the Lord exactly the same way, and that just wasn't going to do. It says in verse 7, be silent in the presence of the Lord. Uh, it's an awesome thing to be in the presence of God Almighty. And when you are in His presence, be quiet. <laughs> Listen to Him. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Anytime you, you see this phrase the, the phrase, the day of the Lord is at hand, something big is going to happen. A lot of times it's not too good. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and he has invited his guests. Now the guests are the, just the nations around about them. They're going to be able to see this sacrifice. These people are going to be sacrificed. They're going to be carried away in captivity. And the nations around about are going to see all this. They're going to be uh, his invited guests. And it shall be 
in the day of the Lord sacrifice, anytime you see in the day of the Lord, something's going to happen. I will punish the princes and the king's children. Now, we know this is going to be the Chaldeans that are going to, to do this, uh, be the instrument of this uh, uh, punishment. Shall I tell them about the air conditioner, David? <laughs> <laughs> it, it does fit, you know. The Chaldeans were the instrument of uh, God's wrath, you know. Of course, we had an air conditioner stolen out back, you know, the the uh, one right directly by the back door of the back building. But the funny thing is, that air conditioner is almost 17, 18 years old, and it was on its last leg. So whoever stole it allowed us to make an insurance claim we got paid for a new one. <laughs> so someone sought to do us harm, but they really did us good. <laughs> so. so anyway, the Chaldeans are also the instrument. They were, they were evil people, but they were doing God's uh, bidding to, to punish uh, Judah. So whoever it was out there that stole that air conditioner, you know, we, we owe them a debt of gratitude. <laughs> Of course, we saw them. We, we may be thankful, but we still have to shoot them. So, anyway, this is the way it works, you know. Uh, he says, I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. Now, this uh, clothed with foreign apparel, they just had assumed the, uh, the uh, habits of the heathen nations in a lot of different ways, not only their clothing, but their practices. They had uh, adopted those heathen practices. In the same day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Now, those who leap over the threshold, it's, uh, the commentator is not quite sure what that means or how that came about. But it, just think of it as someone who is uh, leaping over the thre threshold to do evil, uh, who's filling their master's houses with violence and, and deceit. In verse 10, And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate. Now, we don't know exactly where the fish gate he is in Jerusalem. We have some idea, but don't know exactly where it is. Uh, a wailing from the second quarter and a loud crashing from the hills. Now, this is really looking forward to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Chaldean, Chaldeans. And there's going to be a mournful cry at the fish gate, whatever, wherever that is. And there's going to be a wailing. People are going to be wailing you know, from the second quarter and a loud crashing from the hills. You, you know, uh, Jerusalem built on hills. And, of course, the towers, there's going to be a crashing from those uh, towers. Uh, it says, well, you inhabit, inhabit, inhabitants of uh, Maktesh. Yeah, if you... I might I forgot what King James said. It may say mortar, M O R T O R. Uh, but that's the, we would call it the uh, shopping mall of Jerusalem. That's the uh, marketplace. So the people in the marketplace, you inhabitants of the marketplace, uh, all the merchant people are going to be cut down. Who you know, the Chaldeans are going to take everything from the market, and all those who handle money are going to be cut off. They're not going to have any money to handle because the Chaldeans are going to take it all. In verse 12, and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps. There is no hiding. Jerusalem. Somebody's going to have a flashlight, and they're going to look in every nook and cranny. 
and punish the men who are settled in complacency. Now, if you get the King James, it's probably settled in Lees, L-E-E-S. And what that is is in the making of uh, uh, wine. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean alcoholic wine, but in the making of uh, sweet wine, if you want to call it that. You know, they're processing, when crushing the grapes, they've left a lot of uh, residue in the bottom. So they would put it in a jar, let it settle, then pour that off, and then let that settle. And then they keep doing that a number of times until you just wound up with the pure juice. But if you didn't tend to your business, it would get uh, kind of sour and uh, syrupy. It would not be the, the really good tasting uh, grape juice. So what it's talking about, those who are settled in complacency or indifference, who say in the heart, the Lord will, do, will not do good, nor will he do evil. The Lord can't do anything, just like an idol, can't do anything. That's what they're saying. Therefore, their goods will become uh, booty whenever uh, Chaldeans <laughs> conquer Jerusalem, destroy Jerusalem. They're going to take all these goods away as their, their booty. And that's the way a lot of the Romans or Chaldeans, whoever it is, the common soldier, that's how they made the, uh, their money, by the booty or the confiscation of goods of the lands that they conquered. They would take that, and that would be their pay. Therefore, their goods shall become, in verse 13, their goods shall become uh, booty, and their houses of desolation. They're going to be emptied out, going to be desolate. <clears throat> they're going to build houses, but they're not going to occupy them. It's going to be such that, uh, well, actually after destroy, they weren't building houses, but the idea is that your normal activities are not going to continue. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. So that's a normal activity. The vineyards are very important back then. The olive uh, grows very important. But they can plant them, but they're not going to be around to harvest. In verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. Remember, the day of the Lord. It is near and hastens quickly. So it's going to come to pass uh, quickly. Now, at the time, Assyria was still in power, but uh, Chaldeans were on the rise. So it's, it's, when it says it's near and hastens quickly, it doesn't mean it's going to happen that day or the next day, or, but it's going to be uh, soon enough. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter, and therefore uh, there the mighty men shall cry out, uh, the mighty men, of course, those are the ones that are mighty men of valor, uh, uh, very accomplished in military arts and what have you, but all their efforts are going to uh, not come to fruition. They're going to fail in their efforts to uh, defend the city. So they're, they're going to cry out, you know, we, we can't defend the city. In verse 15, we say we see six days and uh, five couplets. Now, a couplet is just a uh, literary technique to emphasize what's being said. You know, you use one word and then you use another word that is a different word, but it emphasizes the same concept. So that day, the day that's coming, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. Trouble is, is distressful, and distress is trouble. 
So they're two different words, but they're alluding to the same thing. A day of devastation and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. We associate, you know, darkness with gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness, like a, like a very thick fog. A day of trumpet and alarm. And you know, a trumpet is the sound of alarm. Against the fortified cities and against the high towers. So these things are going to come upon the uh, fortified, fortified cities. The Chaldeans are going to conquer those. And usually a fortified city has these high towers that you have, you know, military men in the towers and what have you, but uh, that's going to fail. It's not going to protect the city. Verse 17, I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men. They don't know where they're going because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust. There's going to be an infusion of blood. And their flesh like refuse. That's the New King James says refuse. ASV in the uh, King James. The word really means dung. Just, just get right down to it. So their flesh is going to be cast out like the... Uh, a dung, whether it's human waste or animal waste, it's going to be just thrown out. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Bribing is not going to work. And you think about it, why would they offer or why would the Chaldeans accept silver and gold? Because they're going to take it anyway. They're going to conquer the city and they're going to take it anyway. So what, what good is a bribe to them? <coughs> Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. God is a jealous God. He will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. And this kind of uh, reiterates what was spoken of in verse uh, 2 following. If you want to go back there and read that. In chapter 2, we have a call to uh, repentance. He says, gather yourself, while well, there's still time, of course, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, old, undeniable uh, nation. Now, this nation was also the word used for the uh, heathen nations. They're going to be invited to the sacrifice. But this one is probably referring to Judah itself and undesirable or shameless. They had no shame. <clears throat> so, send gather yourselves together. <laughs> Jerusalem, Judah, who, had, who does not have any shame. Before the decree is issued, before the day passes like chaff, you know, it you know, chaff when they're threshing uh, wheat or what have you. Chaff is what's left. It's, it's kind of thrown away. <clears throat> before the Lord's uh, fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes out upon you. Again, remember the, what the day of the Lord is. <clears throat> so this uh, before the decree is issued, there's going to be a time when the uh, destruction is... Uh, inevitable. There's going to be a time when repentance is uh, it's going to be ta past the time for repentance. <clears throat> and the decree is you're going to be destroyed. Before that happens, though, you need to repent. In verse uh, 3, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, and the meek of those that or uh, in, they're submissive to God's will and they uh, have a humble and meek attitude. They are to seek the uh, Lord. 
those who have upheld uh, his justice. So there's still a remnant there that uh, are uh, obedient to God who have upheld his justice, seek righteousness, and seek humility. You see those three seek, seek the Lord, seek righteousness, and seek humility. They all go hand in hand. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. <clears throat> now this is, uh, we need to be careful about the words. It does not say that they will avoid the Lord's anger. Even those who are innocent, you know, you, you take uh, Daniel and his uh, friends, his three friends. They may not have been deserving of the what uh, happened to them, being carried off to, to uh, Babylon, but it happened anyway. So it does not mean when it says, perhaps you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. It doesn't say they're going to avoid the consequences of uh, the punishment to be envisioned upon Judah and Jerusalem. But they not not necessarily suffer everything that everybody else suffers. Kind of a hidden, still part of it, but kind of hidden. Now here we have a uh, a series of uh, judgments against different nations, and if you look at where these nations are, uh, you, we would we would say. They're in the north, south, east, and west. That's not the order that's here, but uh, this judgment applies to all nations, not just Judah. So here's a series of uh, judgments against the west, the uh, east, the south, and the north, and we'll go through these in order. For Gaza, you know, Gaza... It's on the coast there. In Ashkelon, Gaza will be forsaken and Ashkelon desolate. Of course, by this time, Gaza didn't exist. It had already been destroyed. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday. Now, at noonday is not necessarily the exact time that this will happen. It can mean one of two things, that it happens so quickly that it's over with by noon, uh, or that it's going to be very soon. Continuing in verse uh, 4, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Now, if you don't want anything to come back, any plant to come back, take the roots with it. You know, it could be trees or weeds or what have you, but take the roots with it. So this uh, Ekron, even its roots are going to be gone. It's not going to come back. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. Now, David's bodyguards came from the Cherethites. And it was probably associated with uh, uh, Philistia, maybe in a, a uh, subset of Philistia. But anyway, uh, they're going to be destroyed too. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you. So they, there will be no inhabitant. And I might add that Gaza is not the present day Gaza. <laughs> Okay, it's not the Gaza Strip, you know. I will destroy you so there will be no inhabitant. The sea coast shall be pastures with shelters, and this kind of a shelter is kind of a rudimentary type of abode uh, to keep sheep in, and it's almost like a den. With shelters um, for the shepherds and folds for flocks, the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. And so it was. There, whatever remnant of Judah that was left, 
you know, use this land for to, to feed their sheep and so forth. They shall feed their flocks there in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lie down at evening. So these people are going to be gone, and the remnant of, of uh, Judah is going to occupy it. The Lord, their God, will intervene for them and return their captives, and they intervene for them. That's Judah. That's not the uh, these heathen nations. And that, and in fact, that did happen. They did. Uh, the uh, the remnant did come back. Did occupy this area. <clears throat> Apparently, it's a very suitable area for uh, uh, feeding sheep and so forth. Now in the east, he said, I've heard, uh, in verse 8, I've heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the people of Ammon. Now you remember Moab and, and uh, that nation, you remember Balak and Balaam? So these were kind of, I think these were the offspring of uh, Lot. So they were, they were relatives of the Jews. But there's an animosity there that just, it just kept on and on. Continuing on in verse 8, with which they have reproached my people. There is always conflict with uh, these people and the Jews. And may made arrogant threats against their borders. Uh, borders are very important back in this time, so whenever uh, some uh, nation or uh, tribes of Israel, whenever they uh, they were given certain borders, they had to honor those borders. So any time a nation tried to, to enlarge their borders, you can expect a war to ensue. Verse 9, therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of the Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Hamon like Gomorrah. And, of course, we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. So the same thing is going to happen to Moab and, and uh, Hamon. They're going to be destroyed. Not exactly the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, but the result is going to be the same. They're going to be overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. Desolation. They're not coming back. Now, of course, there are people that occupy that land today, but it's not these people. So these people are not coming back. And continue on, verse 9, The residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. Again, that's, that's what happened when the... Uh, remnant came back this they shall have for their pride you remember the the pride of these folks back in Obadiah we talked about their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts they were related to them but they were still very prideful and wouldn't have really much to do with them uh, let me get down to the next uh, area. Verse 11. Uh, well, made arrogant threats against the Lord, uh, people of the Lord, the host. The Lord will be awesome to them. It's going to be very amazing to them. For he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. Their idols are not going to do them any good whatsoever. People shall worship him, each one from his place. Indeed, uh, the shores... Indeed, all the shores of the nation. Again, it's not when it says nations here. It's not talking about Judah. It's talking about all the other nations. So those, even those in remote locations, eventually, they're going to worship uh, the one to come. And this is certainly a messianic uh, indication here that the peace people are going to worship him in this messianic age each one from his place, wherever they are. There's not going to be a necessary for, for a Jerusalem. And all nations are going to engage in this. So we'll start with verse 12 next Wednesday night. Thank you.